Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Grandmaster Plan podcast, the premier podcast for high-level Gwent talk, strategy, and analysis. I am joined by my two co-hosts here today, Shoe Plays. How you doing, Shoe? Hello, everybody. Uh, sorry about that overlay. I just had to fix it real quick, but how's it going? <laughs> and True Dawn, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing well. Sweet, sweet. So we've got um, a hot list of topics going on here today. Uh, Shu, what, what do you think? Where do you want to start today, dude? Hmm. Well, there hasn't really been too much big news. I mean, there's that arena thing, but, you know, who cares about that, really? <laughs> that little thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I guess we'll start there. The big announcement, uh, Arena, the long-fabled alternate game mode, is now coming to Gwent uh, soon TM. And we kind of got a little bit of a sneak peek look at it. Um, so why don't we just go around general? What do you guys think? It's it's pretty... I think it's less exciting maybe than people were expecting. It's very, you know, very similar to like Hearthstone Arena. Just play cards, pick pick three. Well, pick one of four. Make your deck and then go go play it. Um, so what do you guys think? Are you, are you cool with them doing something that's very similar to other formats in Magic and Hearthstone? Or were you hoping for something maybe more exciting or different? Well, this is not too similar to, like, Magic and Hearthstone. Um, there's, so there's, like, a, the question you have to ask for Arena is, even though it is a new game mode, what is the likelihood we think it's actually going to cultivate new and interesting experiences? Because we're playing with all the same card. In Magic, for example, limited formats are not played with the same cards that constructed formats are. They're, like, lower raw power level, but they also, like, Factions have slightly different identity. Like, they may not have as good removal as they're constructed or whatever. Like, threats may be at a different mana cost, etc. Things play differently in Limited, so even if you are pretty well acquainted with Constructed, Limited's going to be a completely different thing. It's going to provide a completely different experience for you. I'm not convinced that Gwent Arena is actually going to play that much differently, especially considering that most cards in Gwent are just proactive, here's my points, this is worth what it's worth, cards, not things that really build towards much synergy. So even though in theory, playing like Square Telecards with Northern Realm cards and like mingling their synergy would be fun, I don't know what synergy you're mingling. Like, I don't... Like, there's not synergy in Constructed, <laughs> how would we expect there to be synergy in the draft mode? So, it'll be like fun and novel for a bit, I'm just, I don't know where the new gameplay experience is coming from. I'm uh, I'm a little on the other side. I'm pretty hyped about the um, the arena mode. A, I just think that it's going to be a cool environment where you get to explore different interactions than you would normally be able to see. Um, for example, I, I think a mode like this is going to be amazing for, like, highlight reels and play of the month kind of stuff. You're going to see, you know, DJ into, you could see DJ into Letho Regis, for example. There's going to be some truly nonsensical stuff going on. Um, I do think it's going to be a fun play experience. Uh, what I would caution against is taking it too seriously or trying to take it to, like, the upper echelon of competitive level play because I don't think the mode is particularly designed for it. I think it's going to be a great thing to do when you want to take a break from ladder, let off some steam, and just have a little bit of fun. Uh, but overall, I don't think the new mode is going to be super competitive because you're drawing from each card in the entire game, so there's no way to put your opponent on a particular hand, uh, so effectively you're incentivized that you can't play around anything, so you play around nothing. There's there's going to be a lot of wonky stuff going on, but I, I do think it's going to be fun. Yeah, I, I'm very interested in how they chose to kind of handle the synergistic aspect of kind of Arena. I mean, they even put it in their, uh, in their little description, you know, you want to pick cards that don't necessarily rely on synergies, just good value on their own. Uh, I think a lot of where the interesting mechanics, like to touch on what Trudon was saying, and kind of new gameplay, is going to come from meshing all these cards together from every single faction, which, uh, you know, it's an open draft. You draft cards from any faction uh, or neutral. Uh, I think that's where a lot of the interesting kind of gameplay elements are going to come from, right? There was a there was a clip, like, last week or something where Swim's playing Consume against, like, Movement, Skoi Tall, and they move his Necker from in front of his Vran, uh, right as it's about to eat, and, you know, he caretakers, uh, uh, I think it's Sheldon Skaggs, and, like, moves everything, and the Necker falls <laughs> right in front of his, uh, right in front of his Vran, and that, like, those are the cool kind of synergies that you can now explore that aren't in the game right now, like, you know, movement and consume and things like that, and maybe, like, reveal with some sort of, like, hand buff sort of thing, you know, it, kind of meshing these up and finding these interesting plays, and I think good players will kind of 
learn to leverage these these different mechanics together like we saw even Berja uh, in the stream picking like a rot tosser and using that to kind of activate his Vandergrift uh, weather. So, you know, it's I'm kind of a, a little bit sad that they didn't kind of push more synergy style gameplay, um, maybe with some different drafting mechanics like overdrafting or things like that. But uh, at the same time, you, you kind of don't want to stray too far into synergy because then you just wind up with constructed, right? Where the decks are super optimized or else synergy... Uh, you're playing certain certain archetypes that are good, so it's it's hard to strike that fine balance. Uh, maybe they're a little bit too much one way, but again, we'll we'll have to see what happens. I, I just wish they would have maybe taken some more risks with it. From the uh, from the strategic outlook that you're putting on it and talking about the synergies and stuff, where do you guys fall um, about the decision to choose your leader last? In my opinion, I think this would have played out a lot nicer. And obviously, um, you know, we got to wait till it's released to the public and everyone really gets their hands on it. It just seems to me that it would have been a little more interesting had you gotten to choose your leader first and then you can sort of build your deck around it. I don't think that you run the risk of it becoming too much like constructed since the card pool is huge. You're drawing from every faction in the game uh but but i think in this way for example you're just never going to see hensel as, le as a leader pop up in arena right like you're going to have to just happen to have taken three machines or something like hensel will never be played i, I think it's going to reduce the overall leader variance a little bit yeah leaders are cards you're supposed to build around and be like the anchor of your deck like make it do a particular thing or have like a particular reliable effect that you can build the rest of the deck around that's how it works constructed and that would be like a pretty valuable thing in limited to know what your anchor is to know like this is my starting point i now can try and build this hen cell deck and maybe i can get there maybe i won't but i now have this like guiding light to try and drive me in some direction where i'm like actually cobbling together some manner of synergy and not just drafting all the high point cards and making the leader go last is just going to make it so it's better EV to just ignore synergy and draft all the high point cards because the blow up potential is just too high and the upside isn't high enough. So you're gonna, just going to see a lot of situations where people are just going to draft whatever and take the high point card and then hit like Bruver or like whatever raw point card is like good enough for their deck. Like Bruver can still hit normal creatures, right? So that's just dwarf. He gets any silver. Yeah, I yeah. believe he silver gets any silver or, or Yeah, so like, like raw point things like that will just be the best option because you can't like like you said, like, oh I want to build Hensel. I'm gonna draft these machines and hopefully Hensel's in the four I get to choose from. Like so yeah, that's weird. But like again, that's stuff that could still like that's not super hard to change and it's still in PTR, so maybe that is something that will change. But yeah, you're correct in its current iteration that seems silly. I think uh with the way like the drafting is now where it's you know we don't know much about the waiting but from what it seems it's kind of like you just get a mixed bag and you're, you're kind of just picking uh you know best point value cards i think picking the leader last is fine with that you know if you had to pick it first it's maybe not so good you know it, at least if you pick it last you have the potential like okay i have a lot of machines in my deck maybe i do want the hen cell or something like that or i got a lot of similar bronzes maybe i do want the hen cell um or, you know, maybe I got a lot of spawn crate cards, something like that, that can get bodies out. Maybe I want full test, where if you pick it first, then you're kind of like shoehorned into that, or you're just going to have a bad draft. Um, I think if you really wanted to make some of the kind of leaders like uh, like Arrakis Queen and Hensel and things like that playable, and again, this is kind of what I was going back to saying, maybe taking some risks with the design of it, you, they could have done something where it's like, okay, you have... Hensel and Morvran as your first leader pick, and then if you pick Morvran, maybe there's some sort of thing where the first like three picks that you have are gonna have the reveal card in the card text somewhere, so that way you can kind of like get your synergized deck going, and then like it's even if you blank out on the rest of the draft, you have some synergy with that there. So things like that, they could have pushed maybe some leaders like Morvran or Hensel that are probably not gonna be. They're probably going to be like trash tier, right? I mean, let's be honest, <laughs> just because the way yeah. it works. Any anything that relies on other cards to be powerful is going to generally be bad. Like there'll be up, like there'll be situations where people get it to all fall into place and it'll be good, but they're going to be few and far between. Yeah, but something like that, they could push the synergy. But again, you got to be careful, just because if you push it too much, then you get back to constructed, like I was saying. But something like that, I think, would be good to kind of push it, but not put it all the way too much on the other end. So. There are going to be um, differences between this and Constructed, obviously. A, the new synergies and stuff, 
But I, I think an interesting point of discussion we can talk about is what types of cards do you guys think are going to be very, very good in this mode? Maybe a little bit better than they currently are in Constructed because... You don't. You don't. You can't build your entire deck based around a certain principle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, on the PTR stream, we saw that there was a pretty heavy emphasis towards weather. In particular, gold weather seemed to be very, very powerful. Uh, I also feel like carryover is going to be insanely strong. Uh, basically, you take more card or old geared over any other silver. I would imagine they just seem completely insane. Uh, there's things like tutors to consider. There's things like spies. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on some of the different card types? What do you think is going to be powerful? I mean, obviously, carryover is the most important thing by a mile. Yeah, spies, so number two, if they stay in, which is unlikely. And if they remove spies from arena, I think it starts. It becomes fair to ask, why are they in the game at all? <laughs> um, yeah, like, anything that allows you to flip the coin is going to be important. Even, oh, yeah. like, so cards like Half-Elf Hunter and Beastmaster that just have a high floor are going to be good, because, in con like, those cards are still good and constructed, but there are engines in Constructed that can sometimes, like, outpace them or make those cards seem underwhelming. Uh, that's going to be harder to do in Arena, like, getting any kind of engine or synergy together is going to be very inconsistent. So all of the cards with a high floor are just going to be higher, like, better relative to the ceiling of the synergy cards. So... What, what what little synergy remains? <laughs> I think actually uh, a lot of the kind of tutor cards are going to be really, really oh, yeah. great. Things like Pavco, uh, even bronzes like Elven Mercenary, things like that. Uh, uh, novice, Alchemist uh, Novices. Um, a lot of those cards, they have very wide pools that they can pull from. Like Elven Merc can pull any special card, right? It's <laughs> not going to be that hard to draft like a decent special card. So those cards are really going to enable like thinning, which is going to be huge in arena because it's going to be extremely hard without like muster units and things like that to get thinning out. Um, and also just like kind of raw power, right? You see when you add like one, two, three points to a card, it just becomes that much more powerful. As you can see kind of with like create cards like Elven Scout and, and uh, Slave Driver. Sorry, I want to say Beastmaster for some reason. Um, but yeah, those create cards are going to be awesome too because you're just always going to get good value for the most part. And again, it's just, you know, whatever bronze card plus, you know, one point, two point, whatever. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, oh, sorry. You can go. No, I was just going to ask, how do you guys feel about, like, removal in uh, Arena? I think a lot of engine cards kind of rely on synergy, like Impair Enforcers, Brigades, Mangonel, stuff like that. Um that kind of makes me think that maybe removal won't be as important because you don't have these engines that you need to worry about. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I agree. I think the single target spot removal, Alzer's Thunder type cards, things like that, um, definitely go down in value since there is, there's just going to be, as you put, uh, just less engines running around. And even if someone does get an engine on board, their deck's going to have far less synergy in it uh, on average than the constructed deck would. Like something like, let's say someone plays a Manganel against you. Um, you're not nearly as fearful of it as you normally would be because mathematically, how often are they going to have a deck that's really, really capable of taking advantage of it, right? So they're less likely to have them in their deck to begin with, and when they do have them, I think they're less likely to be nearly as profitable in the long run as you would see in Constructed. So I think removal like that's not going to be great. Um, I think removal, like mass point removal, things like Scorch, for example, I feel like are going to be very good. Uh, they're not going to be played around too often. There's going to be some situations where you just sort of have to play right into it because once again you're incentivized not to play around anything so i think stuff like scorch is good but the engine removal cards are going to be bad yeah spot removal is definitely not going to be great because the, all the like manganel in particular is balanced around its uh, potential ceiling so it's a seven point when you play it so it needs to go off about three times for it to equal like a normal proactive do nothing card like beastmaster or half of hunter so what are the odds that you're going to get four hits from it in your draft deck like very low so, and then you have to draw them too, right? Yeah, you yeah. have to like draw them at the same time. Like, so if you see a Mangonel, it's like yeah, sure. Or I guess it's nine. It has the initial trigger, so you only need two. But same, same thing. Like, it's going to be a lot harder to make those cards good. So you don't have to do, care about killing them. Scorch, I actually think, isn't going to be very good just because it's going to be hard to know who's going to have the bigger things. It'll, it'll definitely fair. be harder to leverage. Like, it's not going to be bad, but. 
Probably it's, like Igni will be better if anything. I think I don't know what like Igni's ever gonna hit. Like even if they get a row that gets up to twenty five, I can't imagine the highest thing in that row being higher fifteen ish. I, so. If you're hitting a 19 point Igni though, that's probably really at the high end of the value. You're but that, but that's like that's the ceiling for it. Like that's not the average. It's the ceiling. So yeah, yeah, true. I, like in that case, I'm not sure that it's worth it. I mean, I think that something like Igni will actually be okay. Um, I, I think cards that are good in the long round are also going to show potential, since there's going to be oh, less yeah. ways oh, to yeah. um, less ways to reverse the coin toss. We're talking about how busted carryover is going to be. It's just going to be the nuts. I think uh, once people settle into it a little bit more, people are going to find that it's very correct to fight over round one even more than normal uh, because of you know. You, you really just can't afford to lose round one, particularly if you're on blue coin. So I think we're going to see longer round ones in general. So things like Igni, um, you know, God forbid you put together Ithlin Tremors, stuff like that. Things that are good in a very long round one scenario, I think are going to go up a lot in value. Um, I agree with that what, completely, yeah. Right? Even things uh, like Hailstorm could be really good just for that reason yeah. alone. Yeah, it's it certainly could be. Like, Yeah. Even, like, for he Dragoon, all the, like, because engines are going to be hard if not viable to get online, you need some kind of ceiling from your cards, and cards that do that by themselves, like for he Dragoon or um, the dude with armor in Northern Realms that pumps adjacent units, his name I forget, like, stuff like that that just by itself gets inevitability or just weather, obviously, that gives your cards a ceiling that they don't need other cards to have which is going to make it so you actually have the ability to fight in a long round without needing all of this to come together. Even stuff like, you know, maybe Aquas, Siri, uh, yeah. Succubus could be really good. If it's sort of this thing where there's less engines, so maybe removal is less good, then maybe these cards can kind of shine, uh, you know, with this kind of void there. But I'm sure if the meta develops where these cards are kind of become highly picked, then, you know, we'll kind of the meta will kind of self-balance into equilibrium. Uh, where removal will get a little bit more valuable, so it's picked more. Yeah, that's, that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. I, I hadn't con yeah. sorry, uh, I hadn't considered that, but just starting to think about it now, things like Siri, Succubus, that type of deal. I, I think you actually hit that spot on the head. Um, I, I have a feeling you're going to be right, and those cards are definitely going to see an increase in play rate, and power level. Yeah, because at worst, like there's an opportunity cost for like taking some gals. Like you're giving up a card that. Is probably going to be worth more, right. and there's like the floor on is so low because it's going to hit like a seven a high time, and like it's very rarely going to kill something that matters. So yeah, even if you tutor, it's just, bad. Yeah, people are just going to be like very disincentivized to take cards like that. So anything that would normally be have its power level capped by thunder is good, and it's worth noting, like you said, there's if the format is healthy, it's going to cycle through level, where like. No one will play removal initially, and then people punish them for it, and then people start running removal again and punish those people. And, like, people won't run weather clear, and then people are run counter it. Like, the constant cycle of leveling is how um, draft formats in Hearthstone and Magic have their longevity, because there's never an objectively correct thing to do. Mm -hmm. So if it's able to replicate that, then that'll, like, help it have, like, some actual longevity and desire for play outside of the initial novelty of it, and that would be good. So hopefully that's the case. I honestly think it will, too, because, you know, like we said, as kind of people maybe start off thinking removal is bad, then, like, there's a lot of engines that are fine on their own, like Smugglers, the, the Alva Cavalry guy, uh, things like the, the Soldier buffing guy from Nilfgaard buffs every time a soldier comes, like, things that are pretty easy to get going. Uh, those will start to rise, and then again, like, removal will start being more valuable, people start picking it more, and kind of those, like, like I, I guess I'll call them soft engine cards, kind of dip down in popularity, and I think you'll see that with a lot of things, like, weather will, will be big, you know, at first people will, will probably pick a lot of weather, and then people will realize that, okay, weather clears are really valuable, I need to pick it every time I see it in the draft, and then weather will kind of die down and things like that, so I think we will get a lot of that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, very high level metagame uh with arena especially more in gwent even more than something like uh hearthstone or anything like that what do you guys think about um i i think we're on the same page that the tutor cards like pavco that you brought up things like that are going to be really powerful what about the ones that don't have bodies attached like effects like the nilf guardian gate and elzer's double cross marching orders things like that uh how do you think they're going to play out in this format yeah marching orders and double cross are just two free points yeah they're great 
yeah. still be really good. <laughs> and and honestly, even something like reinforcements, like you get what you want when you need it. And I think that's really valuable too. Yeah, um, I think the flexibility is going to be very important, like on the mages and stuff. Right. Something like double cross and marching orders could be a little iffy just because there's you know, it's, you can't really set your deck up to where you know what you're pulling most, if not all the time. So that could be a little iffy, but since again, I think most of the cards you pick are going to be just pure value. I don't think it'll be a huge problem. Yeah. So I, I guess, uh, kind of touching on what Joe was, was pointing about earlier, like how competitive do you think this draft mode could be? I've seen a lot of complaints on people early, like there's a lot of RNG with, you know, unlimited amounts of golds and silvers. Uh, kind of the draft can be a crapshoot. There's a lot of cards that can be dead or semi-dead in your draft. You know, muster units, just bad bronze cards. Like, with a lot of the, the, the RNG elements and I guess the kind, of, uh, the kind of unknown meta that we have, like, how competitive do you guys think uh, Arena can be? Um, there's certainly uh, some inhibiting factors that are preventing it from being as competitive as it could be. Um, one of the chief ones, obviously, is... Sorry. The incongruous amount of golds across players. Like, some person can draft, like, seven golds, and the other person can only have five. And the person who has five is just at a fundamental disadvantage from the person who got seven. Like, their deck is just inherently less powerful on a raw basis for no reason, like, through no fault of their own. In Magic, for example, all of that is normalized because you each open a pack, you all see a rare. And then if you could get past another rare, but... That your opponent like lets you have that like they had agency over that decision so the po raw power level of decks is like pretty normalized and if it's like a lopsided it's because people made bad decisions but just that alone is a big deal <laughs> for it not having a whole bunch of competitive integrity and the other thing is like you said uh it just has a lot of swingy cards um the thing that makes it super competitive in games like magic is that you have all of these like very grand I guess granular is the right word. Like these tiny exchanges like happen again and again and again and you're just trying to scrape out edges over these like small interactions. And Gwent doesn't really have that dynamic where you're trying like doing combat map and you have these tricks in like Okay, sorry, my computer just like almost died. <laughs> <laughs> but you have like these combat tricks and all these like little things that you have to normally like the margins you don't like matter so much more because all the cards are so bad. Um, I'm not sure like how much that's going to come up in Arena because of how little interaction matters. Yeah, I think um, on a scale of one to ten, I would put the overall competitiveness at like a two. Uh, but I don't think that that's what this mode is about, and I think if you're looking at it to be super competitive, you're probably just approaching it wrong. That seems very clear to me that that's not what this mode was designed for. Besides the fact that there's going to be, as Shrewdom was speaking to, this large disparity in the overall power level of starting decks, which is just not a good fundamental place for something uh, to be highly competitive, I think the bigger issue to me is the fact that you're largely incentivized not to play around anything. When you're playing Constructed, you have a fair, if you see a Bruver deck, you have a fair idea of what cards your opponent's playing in there. You can play around to Shiru. You can think what they may be holding. Um, you're using the information you have to try and discern more information to make the most educated decisions. And since we're drawing cards from all factions here and all the cards are generated effectively completely randomly, you just you don't have this ability to increase your knowledge about what your opponent could be holding, why they're playing in a certain way, so you're incentivized to not play around anything. Um, and I think that takes a large part of the um, the play skill dynamic out of it. That that to me is the single biggest reason why I don't think it'll be super competitive. I think uh, I think I might play a little bit devil's advocate on this one. Um, I think some concerns that people have are quite valid. I think others maybe not so much. Uh, things like, you know, unlimited number of golds, I don't think that's a huge problem. Uh, we see it in Hearthstone decks a lot where, you know, some guy can get, like, five legendaries or some guy can get, you know, a really great deck, uh, mage deck with, like, four fireballs or something like that. Insane. Uh, so I think that kind of stuff happens in Hearthstone and, and maybe other, uh, draft formats as well. I'm not super familiar with Magic, but, and, you know, people still seem to 
carve out some competitive niche in that. Like we see a lot of the top players in like Hearthstone Arena being, you know, consistently good. Um, I also, I think some of the more valid complaints are like what Trudon is saying. There's, you know, in Hearthstone Arena, you kind of see it shifts more like away from control and combo to like kind of value and, and trading it becomes a lot more important uh, type decks. So with with Gwent not really having any combat system like that kind of it's it's hard to see how that will work in Gwent's arena. Um, I think another thing that would go a long way to making it competitive too, as far as I've heard, there's not really a system which kind of lines you up with people with like similar records. Am I right about that? It's like if I'm on nine wins, I'm not, you know. It should put you against the same people. That's like a super easy thing to do. That's important. So I would hope not. Right. Yeah, I haven't heard one way or the other, but I, I think if they do that, that will certainly help. Yeah. I could be very wrong, but I think I've heard that they don't really do matchmaking that way, in which case I think it's, like, a lot less competitive. Like, when you're in Hearthstone, you're getting up to 9, 10 wins. You're, like, you're playing people with good decks, you know? All the kind of bad decks have been weeded out for the most part. So it becomes a lot more competitive in that aspect where, okay, now we're in the big boy ranks, you know, of wins we're facing off against these crazy decks, like, but my deck's really crazy too, or I've been playing really well, but this guy is also playing really well. So I think if they don't have that, which I think they don't have, that really erodes a lot of the, the competitiveness of the mode. But again, like I said, Hearthstone, like, they have a ton of RNG, they have, like, legendaries and things like that. So I think it will s still be pretty competitive for the most part. Well, it's also important to note in... um. In Hearthstone, legendaries are not inherent. Like they're like in the way Gwent is designed, bronzes are worth an average of like twelve or whatever. Like they've changed the formula a million times. Let's so say, for example, like bronzes are an average of twelve, silvers are an average of fourteen, golds are an average of sixteen. Like those are that's a fundamental power level shift from rarity to rarity that like doesn't really exist in like Magic or went like legendaries are statted differently but they're situational or whatever they synergize with things like they're not actually over statted like there's rares and stuff in hearthstone that are better than a lot of legendaries i'm not not really the case in one i might argue against that like hearthstone like you have ragnaros sylvanas things like that just straight up beastly cards you're not getting that in like the rare common well, card pool but those are like the high end like i'm talking like average like the the floor of uh, a legendary in Hearthstone is way, way lower than it is in Gwent. But Gwent, you have the same thing, right? I mean, you've got Canby, you've got, you know, other bad cards like that. Even something like Sarthisius, like, probably not great in this mode. You know, 11 points, you yeah. can see your points deck, so what? But yeah. I mean... But you, but you also have to, like, gauge that against, like, similar bronzes. So, like, yeah, there's, like, garbage golds, but there's also garbage bronzes. So, you could get, like, if you're getting more golds than your opponent, you're still getting more raw power level, because, like, yeah, you get a bad gold, but, like, they could have a, like, instead of, in that spot where they would have had that gold opportunity where you got, they could have, like, a medium bronze, and it's just as good. Right. Or, like, a right. bad bronze. So, like, that's, just having that fundamental power imbalance for no reason seems tough. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I can see that. So while we're uh, while we're talking about competitive and stuff, there is going to be this highly competitive tournament going on <laughs> next weekend, the Wild Hunt Tournament in Philadelphia. Uh, this is going to be played and constructed, obviously. So let's talk about the meta, what decks we think are good, what we're going to see there, what you might potentially bring to a tournament lineup. What have you guys been playing, and what do you think is at the top of the ranked meta right now? I've played, like, every type of Skellige deck imaginable, and I want to cry. <laughs> it's very sad. Purple's not treating you well, huh? It's, I mean, like, if you look at the Gwent up meta report, like a 51% win rate with uh, Bran and Croc, which, yeah, sounds about right, but it's, like, if you ever play against Square Tell, like, if you lose the coin flip against Square Tell, you can't do anything. The game's over. And that feels really bad. So, uh... There's just, like, not a lot of play uh, with Skellige right now. The cards don't really have a ceiling, and the ones that do are comically easy to interact with, like Greatsword. That's, the, like, one of the few cards that still, like, has a ceiling if you do things to enable it, and it dies to the entirety of the universe. So, Skellige, yeah, it's, like, you still have Carryover, which is the only reason the factions... The only reason the factions are really playable is because of the 
So you have that, and that matters. But it's there's just so much, like, it's so underpowered compared to everything else. Like, uh, for, like, veteran, for greatsword, for, like, they're all just play your dude decks, and they're worse play your dude decks than Square Tell. Yeah, I'm really interested what you were saying about uh, the coin flip in Skoyatal with uh, Skellige, because they do, now that kind of carryover has been really, let's say, toned down across the board, yeah. uh, you could say gutted, and maybe that wouldn't be too far from the truth either, but Skellige still seems to me to have like the most consistent, easy to set up, uh, still relatively safe carryover. Like, you just dump out like a Morkvarg, Old Geard, Wolfsbane, like, that's pretty good setup. You've got Olgaird, which is pretty much uninteractable. Uh, you've got Morkvarg just for the easy carryover and Wolfsbane too. Um, so I'm kind of surprised that you're, you're having struggles against uh, ST with the coin flip. Because well, outside of War Dancer, they, yeah. they don't have much, and Olgaird kind of beats that. Their deck is so much more. like, and for, like I'm referring specifically to the Elves Mulligan deck. Mm -hmm. uh, that deck's power level is so much higher than yours that it doesn't matter. Like, they just, like, if you get your card, they'll just be like, okay, whatever. Like, he, like so say, for example, you lose card up. They'll just 2-0 you. Like, you just It's just lose. a tempo thing, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So, a lot of the, a lot of the gameplay patterns that normally make Skellig very strong aren't viable against that deck. Because their long round is preposterous. Yeah, um, I, I really agree with what you're saying about what's going on right now. I think with... There's a couple exceptions, such as like the Dagon deck and the Greatsword deck that you're talking about, but I think that the coin toss is at an all-time high as far as the amount that it's impacting the wins and the losses on the game right now. And I think that the large majority of the decks that are seeing success are really built to fully take advantage of it. I also think that as time goes on, players have gotten better. They're learning more. They're watching streams. They're watching tournaments. They're taking these high-level strategies. And I think your average player is getting much better at leveraging the coin toss um, to its full potential than they used to be, say, two or three months ago. So I, I just think it's an all-time high as far as its impactfulness and what's going on right now. And that's why we're seeing a lot of these decks succeed. Like, like to your point before, the, the Mulligan Squayatel deck, right? It just throws so many points down. Um, Elrin is particularly offensive in that deck, coming yeah. out as a less conditional six-point Roach to yeah, just add tempo on top of tempo. It's free points the deck. Like, you could have Roach, Elrin, those Mulligan guys that pull your ass. Like, you're just doing things that are, like, normal stuff, and then it's just like, oh, here's four points. Here's six <laughs> points. Here's 12 points. Just, like, on the house for no reason. It just happened, like, the whole game. So, obviously, the deck's going to be good with just, like, free-rolling all these extra points. I think uh, one thing with the meta that's kind of uh, surprised me and also maybe slightly worrying is that um, decks with kind of very focused game plans, uh, something like an Axeman, something like a Movement ST, uh, where, you know, you're relying on a few things like weather and having these few engine units like uh, Axeman or the, the Marksman guy, I, I feel like after kind of the midwinter, I would have expected these decks to kind of rebound just because, like, Skeletal got a little worse, Dwarves got a little worse. So, like, you know, Dwarves, it's very easy to throw in these counters. You have Scorch and things like that, and then you're outpowering. And and also, uh, whereas, you know, Dwarves kind of held back some of these different archetypes, even control decks. Um, but now even after the, the kind of patches, these decks still seem to be kind of held down a little bit. Um, I think it might be because removal is kind of really good in this meta. Um, you know, you see things like Alchemy, even like ST runs like a lot of Thunders, things like that. Um, and also I think Create has kind of, you know, made these decks worse just because, you know, decks that maybe before would be really countered by these kind of like Axemen movement type decks, just because you they're, they're building their deck in a way where they don't have access to the counters. Now they kind of can like free roll for these counters and still not hurt their overall strategy just by throwing in like a rune stone or like you see it with alchemy with like black blood or something like that or whatever that card is. Um, so I think without these kind of decks in the meta, it, it kind of does let something like, you know, elves kind of run a bit more rampant, right? In the past, something like that, which is a pure like swarm pointy deck, you know, Axemen would have feasted off that, or even, like, Movement ST, but now, like, you can throw in, like, a couple of Elven Scouts, which are already really good, you know, they already build towards your game plan, but also you can high roll, like, a Weather Row Clear, you can high roll Panther and remove, you know, an Axemen early, stuff like yeah. that, so 
That is slightly worrying to me, I think. Yeah, it's it's a poker player's dream, right? There's just infinite free rolling going on right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I I completely agree. One of the problems right now also is that um, you're not really able to take advantage of these engine decks. The great <laughs> showing some potential, and I think the reason the Great Shore deck is showing some potential is the built-in redundancy. They have a lot of ways to pull out their great swords, and after you kill them, they can bring them back. So they're sort of insulated against some of this removal, and I think in large part these decks are being kept in check by the alchemy deck that's running around. Um, I actually, I'm surprised to see where it comes in on the uh, on the meta report here. It's only showing an overall 49% win rate and 10.6% popularity, but it's been my early impressions in uh, in sort of the beginning to mid phases of this meta that the alchemy deck is the best thing going on. I, I firmly believe that it is the most powerful deck, and what it's doing, having these Viper Witchers being so powerful, is just keeping down all of these engine decks so that you simply just cannot get your engines to stick on the board. Uh, they're able to play three, they're able to play three more later if they really need to with the ointments, so they, they have a lot of ways to keep this in check. And if you can't get engines rolling against them, the question then becomes, how do I fight against them? Well, you would have to fight against them with raw points. And the, the things like Slave Driver is particularly egregious here because they're playing your cards uh, with an extra point with an extra body attached, and they're also getting the selection. Some people are saying, yes, it's RNG, and they can miss, blah, 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 blah. But you're also missing the utility of, if I draw a griffin in my hand as a monster player, I have a griffin. If you play a slave driver, you can choose, am I getting a griffin? Am I getting a Dao? Am I getting a Larry the Ark yeah. score? What's better for this situation? I, I think that's a little bit troubling. Yeah, slave driver's bonkers. That card should, like, I, I was, like, Luke on it initially. Like, I was kind of sketchy on it. And then I was like, yeah, this is probably not great. And now it's like very obviously egregious. <laughs> it just shouldn't be a thing because you're just playing your opponent's deck better than they can play their deck. And that seems counterproductive. It's not very fun to have your own cards played against you at the higher rate. So, um, yeah, Slave Driver is not great. Uh, like we were talking about with uh, Viper School Witchers, I think that the problem is you can recur them so much. You're talking about how Skelligus, like Great Swords, for example, has some level of insulation against um, the like removal because they can like find more Great Swords. Well, they can find more Witchers, so they're just always going to have like more removal. And to be fair, it's fine like that a deck should like if you have a bunch of removal, you should get rewarded for that. But in the case of Alchemy Nilfgaard, it's just free roll removal just like removal that exists at no cost so that's like it just makes it so it oppresses other decks out of the format without making its matchups elsewhere worse which is not what you want to have going on because you're just removing decks from viability for no reason although i largely agree with you i would contend with one thing i don't think it's at no cost it's no cost gameplay wise but there is the very real deck building cost of having to cram x amount of alchemy cards into your I mean, deck like like but the alchemy cards are below rate like they're all like fine <laughs> like the, the last few can be a little bit like the ointments are great things like that uh but you, you do find yourself playing like runestone foul l and a lot of these decks i think like you're usually playing nine to ten the first seven or eight are basically free Honestly, uh, I honestly don't mind alchemy too much in terms of like Viper Witchers and the things they can do with like tutoring these alchemy cards and things like that. I think the biggest egregious point of that is really the create cards like Slave Drivers, uh, you know, the Rune Stones and things like that. Um, because like you take what's a very, a very focused deck like alchemy, like that's part of the cost of getting this kind of powerful return from Viper Witchers, right? Is like you build your deck in a very specific way, very specific cards in order to activate this, you know, immense power that these cards have. But by having these create cards in the deck, you can kind of say like, okay, we're going to take a very focused deck that's powerful because it's focused. And now, oh, by the way, you can also do other things as well, right? It's yep. like, yeah. it's, it kind of takes something where it's pretty healthy and good for the game, you know, a hard control deck, but it's very good at one thing. So it's, again, counterable. And you kind of open it up to being just overall good. And I think that's one of the main problems with the alchemy uh, list. 
yeah, I, I think it's mostly slave driver based. I, I could rant and rave about this card for hours. I, I think it's the yeah. second worst design card in the entirety of the game. Like wait, when your opponent's free rolling into you, you're playing a Death Wish deck, and they're just pulling carryover out of your deck whenever they want carryover. Uh, they're pulling long-term value cards like Larry the Arc Spore when they decide that's proper. Just the inherent. I, I think you put it really, really well, Shu, in the fact that you know it's it's this linear thing that it's sort of predictable and what's going on and they have to put these very specific cards in their deck and then they just get all of this additional utility and flexibility off of this one bronze one thing i'm i'm really surprised of actually and i was telling you this uh, earlier joe is is the dagon kind of uh coming out really far in the meta like i'm seeing it a lot i'm seeing a lot of people have a lot of success with it and uh i'm seeing it do like just really well in general like more so than I thought it would be, especially compared to the last uh, patch. Uh, why do you guys think like Dagon's doing pretty well now? I've been basically playing only Dagon for the last couple of weeks because when Dagon's good, that's just how I play Gwent. Um, I, I think what's going on with the Dagon deck right now is it's one of the few decks that's able to see some success without particularly abusing the coin toss. Uh, and that's because it has sort of every kind of tool. It's got a good long round, it's got a good short round, and it's got great flexibility and utility. So while it's sort of your typical mid rangey deck, right? It has interaction, it can mess with your opponent's plan just enough. There's a lot of little cute interactions, particularly you get off of Al Ghul being able to mess with a graveyard to fight against a Shawnee or an Olgeard things like that. It sort of does a little bit of everything. It's just disruptive enough to throw your opponent off of their toes while being able to function largely very well in both a long round and a short round. It sort of just checks all the boxes for a competitive deck without doing any one thing super well or any one thing like over the top power one. Yeah. That was really well said, yeah. I mean, they even have like carryover too, you know, you run a couple of uh, mm -hmm. barbacoas as you call them, uh, barbagazis, <laughs> things like that. Um, that's pretty cool too. I guess uh, we would be remiss if we didn't at least touch on kind of the Sky Tall faction. Uh, it seems to me like they're the best. I think right now we've seen kind of this Bruver deck uh, concocted by Swim pop up, and that's really good. It's like kind of a Mulligan Elfy Swarm type list. Uh, what do we think about that one? Do we like this? style gameplay more than the dwarves or is it still something where it's kind of like uh you know okay what what gameplay <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand <laughs> they're just they're putting cards on the table and then points happen it's like it, it's it, I mean, it's like it's the problem with gwent on like a larger level but for whatever reason it seems to always coalesce and what i tell in the past couple months where it's just like yeah, here, you just play these cards, and you happen to get points on the house over the course of the game for reasons, and you win. And that's it. <laughs> like, that's the whole joke. So. I mean, you're right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's what's going on. But there are a couple of additional reasons. A, I do think the deck is super powerful, just on its own, right? Like, vomiting points is great in Scoia'tael. Apparently, that's what they want Scoia'tael to be doing. But I don't think that's the only factor. Um, I think, A, the deck is super easy to play. It's basically like mulligan away Aleron and throw cards on them. So your average level players that's never hit Grandmaster before, things like this, um, they're able to find a newfound level of success because of the ease of play of the deck. I think that's part of it. Uh, I swim streamed it. I mean, that's always going to increase popularity. You have the faction war going on, and that's certainly going to influence the type of decks people will choose. And I think, once again, most importantly, guess what it has? Guaranteed access to a free spy, or not free, a cheap spy every single game. Good old Bruver into Yaven, man. Good old Bruver into Yaven. Just being able to have that whenever you want it. Because there's so many times now where it's like, oh, I didn't draw my spy and it would be great here. But since I didn't draw it and this happened round one, now I have to pass. I have to guarantee my extra card. The Bruver deck simply never has this problem. Um, because it has its spy whenever it wants it, and it's also capable of answering back at your opponent's spy at a cheaper rate. If you give me 13 points and I give you 9, well, now I'm ahead. Yeah, there's a... And it also has, like, the only other carryover card in the game in war. Yeah. So, like... <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's the best deck. It, I don't believe it to be particularly close. Uh, if you are trying to win on ladder, play that deck. And but but aside from like power level, it's just the 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 problem with that deck and most of the other decks is you're never incurring a cost for your deck's upside. Like 
there's you could argue that the guys that pump all your elves require a lot. But a like they're they're free. They just happen on the mall. <laughs> You're not paying a cost for this. And, and like B, that's not real setup. Like just the round going several rounds isn't you setting anything up. It's just playing the game. So I just want to see like it, like something anything that like requires you to pay a cost to get like all this like upside stuff. So like if you want to have all like this big rally effect where you pump all your elves, like you have to do something. You have to do something your opponent can do instead of just, I'm going to play my half elf hunters, or I'm going to play like my blue mountain commandos and then my Ison Grim, and then that's it. Or I'm going to play my half elf hunters and then mulligan my dude, that's it. Like, you're not playing the game. You're not making. And that's. That gameplay pattern is across every faction. It's not just a Square Tell thing. It just so happens that Square Tell's the best deck for it. It's even. It's like, even though, like, it's very prominent in Skellige, like, there are very few decisions to be made in Skellige, and it feels real bad. It just so happens that they're a work version of Squiretel, so... Like, what I is. will say about it in relation to um, the Dwarf deck, as Shu's original question was, um, one noticeable difference here is I do think that this deck is much easier to counter. Um, I don't play a ton of Northern Realms myself, but, for example, I've been talking to um, some Northern Realms aficionados. I talked to Stellenbrate a little bit, and I was talking to Quill and Lance for a little bit about this, and I've heard that Hensel completely dumpsters this deck. Uh, whereas, with the Dwarf deck, it was really hard to counter it uh, just because of its raw points and rate, and, like, it was on such a small amount of bodies, things like that. It, but this deck does seem counterable. If you want to beat it, you can go out there and achieve, like, a very positive win rate against it. Now, that might be at the cost of tanking your other matchups, but um, I, I do think that's a noticeable difference. Yeah, I yeah. think that's a good point. Like, the blow to, like, uh, your with Meditation and, like, even, like, Ithlanite Tremors, like, they lost a lot of this good control stuff. So it went from, you know, Dwarves where they literally do everything and do it the best to now, like, this deck does something, one thing, really, 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 really well. And they have some control, but not a ton. So it, definitely a step in the right direction. I think, again, just the midwinter, like, you come out with so many cards, change so many cards, like, it's going to take a few patches before you get back to being really balanced. And like we touched on in previous episodes, we kind of saw this, like, the less cards they... You know, the closer they got to balance, the less cards they had to change. So when you change a huge swath of cards in one, like, it's going to take a long time to get back to that balance state that you had. Um, last thing I want to touch on just before we, we move on to viewer questions is, uh, what the hell happened to Reveal and also Spies? Like, we kind of see these decks just kind of fell off a cliff. Uh, did you guys see this coming? Is this something that you're surprised about? I mean, I think most people won't be too surprised, but what, what are you guys' thoughts on this? I guess people figure it out if you just never pass again. Like, if you just go down two cards and they, like, the rest of their deck is garbage after you just get through the Movran, so, like, that's, <laughs> you're good. Um, yeah, that was, that's why that deck is bad. And, uh, I'm not, like, I don't know why Spies is, is, is that bad. It's, I guess the game has just power crept past it, because it literally hasn't changed. Like, the Spy deck, I'm pretty sure if you look at a Spy deck from six months, or, like, four Ago was the very same, similar, yeah. like point for point almost, and that deck was like borderline oppressive, if not just oppressive. So they, I guess everything just power crap past it. They <laughs> did get a few answer. very small nerfs, like uh, for example, renew and uh, uh, royal decree. The way those work, they only pull units now. Like that hurt kind of one variant of the spies that we saw, and also mm -hmm. like kind of the roach change and Vilgeforts, That whole order of events that we saw with the new engine. That also slightly dinged them, but those are very small things. I think you're right. For the most part, they're pretty much the same, and a lot of stuff did get power crept past yeah. it. A lot of a lot of people in the chat are bringing up how like easily engines are disrupted. That's really part of it. Like that's what I was yeah. talking about. Yeah. Like alchemy, alchemy doesn't incur for being as oppressive as it is towards engines. Like it's it's not getting punished by anything. Like it's getting punished by Squirtle because Squirtle is like all comically overtuned. But on like a fundamental like gameplay balancing basis like you're just free rolling these like nine ten damage cards and it's be wildly oppressive towards various archetypes and there's nothing you could do on the back end to punish them for it outside play the best deck yeah i think that i was a little surprised about uh not seeing spies but it makes a lot of sense with the the rise in the amount of sorry about that guess with the rise in the amount of viper witchers that you're seeing um 
Also, the, the nerf to Imperial Enforcers was huge. Let, let's just get that right out of the box. The card was way too good, completely <laughs> busted beforehand. Uh, it was like free rolling 20-odd 20, uh, 20 points on a bronze. It was just crazy. Um, so I think that, A, the meta has become a little bit more hostile to that type of effect, and B, the effect's just not as good as it used to be when you do get it off, um, and C, it's much harder to play with, so I think that some of your top players could be showing some success with this type of deck, uh, but there's really no reason to because the Alchemy deck is so insanely powerful. We talked a lot about their bronzes earlier. One thing I did talk about was, um, was the fact that it just has the best finisher in the game. Like I said, I've been playing a lot of Dagon, and I've been getting myself into a lot of scenarios against Alchemy where you're up a card in round three and these six or seven card rounds, you know, six, five, seven, six, things like that. And I I'm just losing easily to this kit here. It's, it's just so many damn points. Um, it it's sort of crazy the finishing power they have. As for Reveal, I wasn't surprised at all. This sort of happens every patch. The Reveal fanboys come out, they play a ton of the deck, then they realize it's bad, and then it goes away. People just forget that, like, it's literally old. Like, Movran's real scary, and then you realize, oh, they're playing, like, Spotter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. The, I, I'm really interested in what you guys are saying about the finishers, because, yeah, it... Spy's finisher, I think, is one of the biggest things that got power crept. Like, you know, the bronzes were always kind of a little bit above everything else, so everything else getting power crept, like, it's not a huge deal, but... The finishers, I think, spies were up here, and, like, everything else almost leapfrogged it. Like, you've got... Because the big spies finisher was always, what, Rain Farm into Joaquin into Rain the Farm big thing. Rain yeah. into the, the Nausicaa Brigade, generally. It, it, it used to always be the Nausicaa Brigade, right? They'd set it up because so that was, was the last yeah, one. perfectly consistent. Yeah, back, yeah. 20-some-odd yeah. yeah. points. But now, I mean, you've got decks with Nova. You've got Alchemy with, like, Kahir into Calvia into Slave Driver into... Like, you know what I mean? Novice into Oyman into, like, these, like, kind of old-school NR chains. <laughs> you even got Elves, which just, like, can kind of uh, put you in a long round. Or even if you have a big finisher, like, you just shear it or something like that. You know, I think a lot of decks kind of got that finishing potential that made Spies kind of worse as a result. And I think that's a big problem with Reveal, too, is, like, Reveal, right now, it's kind of set up as, like, you use Tempo and reveal synergies, and then, like, the second half of your game is just, like, Bork? Like, you know what I mean? It, it, it feels very, like, if reveal had a good finisher, I think it might be a lot better, and something even that synergized with it, but right now it's just got a lot of, like, it's got really good early game tempo, but then you kind of limp through the second half of the game. Yeah, the deck sort of just falls off a cliff, right? It comes out like a truck coming at you. Yeah. But if you take that truck hit, its middle game is, like, all right. Um, when you have the Alchemist going off into the Foot Soldier, guys, like, this is okay. You're getting decent value off of your cards enough to sustain. And then its late game is super weak. Which is why, in the past, you've seen this deck try and rely on what I would call gimmicky stuff. Like, multiple Scorch effects in Bork, Scorch, Yen. Uh, they were very, very good at throwing 400 spies at you when that was allowable. <laughs> Gold Weather. They're basically trying anything to pull the rabbit out of their hat, so to speak, to, to turn this early huge tempo swing into actually converting that into a win. And uh, sometimes they're able to piece it together uh, just because of the initial surge of power they get from, you know, the Morvrin. But um, a, a lot of times they just can't compete with these more consistent decks that do have access to better finishers. Yeah. All right. Um, well, that's the meta, guys. So there you have it. Um, I think what we'll do now is we'll move into uh, viewer questions. So go ahead and type some stuff in the chat if you guys want us to answer at Top Deck Gwent. Um, real quick while we're waiting for those to come in, we'll tell you guys once again about the Wild Hunt. Uh, I heard some cool guy called Joe. Oh. <laughs> Joe Snow will be casting. Uh, that'll be really fun. I'll be competing in there. Uh, I hope that I'll be able to get one or two sets at the caster's table as well. Um, but that well, is I hope be... you win the thing. Aim for winning the thing. If you scrub out, <laughs> we'll talk about getting you in the booth. I hope I can do both, honestly, but, you know, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but yeah, that'd be really cool. Uh, I hope you guys all tune into that. Joe, is that, do we know where that's getting streamed? That's on the, uh, 
Uh, yeah, but that's going to be through the Nerd Street Gamers Twitch channel. The Nerd Street Gamers is the event hall that will be hosting the event. They are awesome. We're going to have a great time there, guys. Um, those of you who saw the hype stream got to see a small taste. We did a little tour of the area, showed you like the 60-some-odd computer terminals. There's giant screens. There's great chairs, couches. There's a little VR setup you can do. Uh, it's just an awesome place for yeah, we're going to have, you know, of course, the tournament stream and then uh, the IRL stream will be just as, if not more fun than that. So hope you guys all tune in and uh, it's going to be good. I see a question I'd like to answer here. Uh, is, it, is it the one I want to answer? From Bird King? Uh, I want to answer Bear Arl's one. So okay, you go first. Let's answer, let's answer uh, them both, I mean. Okay. <laughs> all right, so... Um, Barrel Roll says, Would it be better to have more lock unlock cards rather than damage cards? For example, if I put your locks and engine turn based on alchemy rather than kill it. it. Just seems like kill cards are too strong now, everything one shots every engine. That would be a way to make it so you incur a cost for having like um interaction or so for example, like if you lock something, it's not worth any points unless the card has a text box, it's rough. So you're using that lock for like a intended purpose that is doing something that like you want it to do you're not just having like oh nine damage if it doesn't have text doesn't matter nine damage so I, that would be a, like a cool way like i don't know if like that specific iteration of changing viper school witchers would be the way but i do think that having like locks at bronze is like for a limited period of time or like one turn windows like making locks more of a thing would definitely be a way to make it so you could still interact with what your opponent is doing but you're, it's like not incidental it's not free it's not like something that you would just be doing anyway. Maybe maybe some lock synergy cards could be cool, right? Like for every card I'll, that you've locked I'll this game, that do Go something. Ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, it's kind of weird, but it it could be I interesting. Like, there's a lot of stuff to play around with there, you know. Yeah, I just I like the that idea of interacting with it without having it just be this. It's, I mean, that it's like not just about it. points. Yeah. Yeah, like you give up the cost. Interaction be about more than points. Although you'd have to have a lot more cards with text boxes that mattered for that to be like a viable thing, but that's one step at a time. Yeah, it's but it's good though, like giving up a cost, you know, yeah. you give up tempo to shut down the sentient card or something. Um so Bird King asked um, what I thought was a very interesting question, and I, I hadn't considered it yet. Should slave driver be spying? So, obviously, it would be really hard to think about the potential implications in a spy deck. For, for this discussion, I'm going to discuss oh, that yeah. in the context of the current alchemy deck. Um, and I actually think that that's a very legitimate way to handle a lot of the problems of this card. A lot of the problems of the card, it, because it has power level, it has flexibility, it has multiple bots. Um, I don't think the card's particularly well designed, even if it was perfectly fair and balanced. Right now, it's neither of those things. At spying, though, now you're giving your opponent a point um, for this extra for this extra flexibility and utility that you're getting, and you don't get the extra body. This significantly weakens the power level of the card, and it also incentivizes the alchemy player to, um, you know, maybe to play Tremors or, or one of like the overdose potions, something like that. So now they sort of have a target where they can. You know, they know they're going to be putting units on their opponent's side of the board, so ways to remove them then become an interesting deck-building decision. I actually really, really like that suggestion. That change would make me a very happy fucking camper. Yeah, it's interesting. I also see a lot of questions about consume and, like, why consume is not highly played right now or is it, etc. I think that the problem with consume is that the decks that, like, don't really need an engine, like, for, like, Squirtel is only slightly less powerful and they don't like they're not vulnerable to things like the ceiling on square the square tell deck is only slightly lower than that of consume and they're not vulnerable to hate so why would like i'd argue it's it's not that those decks have the same amount of points but i think that removal is pretty heavy right now with alchemy and even st runs a lot of removal things like that and uh even if it's not you know like a muzzle or an artifact compression that's like quote unquote banishing the necker, like even just getting those out of the deck early is, is really detrimental to consume. So I think that's hurting them a lot. It's actually rare that I disagree with True Dawn. We we tend to think in a lot of the same ways, but I, I do fundamentally disagree with that. Um, I think there's a very large difference with the monster deck compared to the Squayatel deck in the fact that the monsters deck has a very powerful and very realistic short round. Uh, whereas the Squayatel deck just doesn't have this. So it, it can effectively like 
once you're adding this other tool of having a short round, it just opens up so much more of the game to you. And I think that's yeah. a very, very large increase in power level there. So I, I think the payoff is reasonable. Um, I, I was very surprised that nothing got changed in the deck because it really does encourage this ultra linear gameplay oh, yeah. where you, you can put... I, I'm going to do this on stream one day, I swear. I, I'm just going to put a piece of paper over my opponent's side of the board and just completely play blind. <laughs> and my win rate's not going to change no, it, with the no, deck. It really doesn't matter. Actually, <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. Like the, I haven't played with it enough. Uh, I was just, based on what I'd seen from the Squirtel deck, it didn't seem that much. So it is close, better. honestly. Yeah, it is yeah close. It's, it's, it's definitely closer than it should be. I think it's definitely closer than it should be. That's fair. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah, the, the points you made are totally valid. Uh, Abga Cow asked a really good question. Do you think Arena would be better if the card backs display the faction that, of the card that was drafted? So Ooh, I I yes. really like this idea, yeah. I think, yeah, that seems neat. I think yes. anything you do to like raise the skill ceiling, which this would, right? Because now you've got an extra layer of information. I think 100%. that's just good in, in any game mode, and this yeah, would definitely and this do that. Was, this was something me and Joe were talking about before. But I don't think we got to it yet. Is that the problem in Arena would have actually correct not to play around particular cards? It's just better value to not do that. And if you have it so, like, it shows the backs, you can actually have more information about what they could potentially have. So it becomes correct to actually play around things and care what your opponent is doing. So yeah, that seems totally reasonable. That's a great change. I, I really like that idea. Get a, Go uh, call CDPR, see if they need a guy for a new job over there. That, that's so good. <laughs> like, you're just getting more information. It's not a ton of information, but you're getting a little bit more information. And like most card games, it is a game of partial information. The more information you have will let you make better informed decisions. Um, and the decision-making process is what's going to separate the better play. You know, the better players will make, on average, more good decisions than your worst players uh so anytime you introduce a new element of information into the game you're theoretically raising the skill ceiling there uh, i i love the change plus it would just be really cool to see like you know this hand with five different colored card backs and all of that and you could sort of tell if they have a lot of synergy like if you see them slam down a great sword and they have four other skelga cards in their hand you might be thinking wow does this guy really have a long ship too should i save this should i prioritize removing that i think it adds a lot yeah it seems like an elegant way to give you some amount of information about what your opponent is doing, but not, like, so much that it's, like, problematic, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, Sir Figgy Newton asks, what deck do you think will rise to the top once Faction Week is over? I think we probably are all in agreement yeah. at this, right? Still score, though. Yeah. I, I mean, it's possible that there's some, there's spot, like, it's possible there's something more powerful in the Squirtel deck, but hope there isn't. <laughs> I guess it's... Hope that, they, that it's, there's not. <laughs> Joe's disagreeing. What What do you think is rising to the top? I think it's really close, but I actually think Alchemy is just the best deck right now. Uh, maybe maybe that's a little biased because I've been playing sort of these mid rangey type of decks. Uh, maybe it's just kind of good against the sort of decks I like to play. I don't know, but it just seems like it has all of the proper tools. Like I was talking about Dagon sort of checked all the boxes to do just enough. Mm -hmm. Alchemy's doing a lot of that, but just much better. It's got a much more powerful finisher. It's got even more flexibility, and it's got much better removal options. Uh, I, I do think that Alchemy is probably just the best deck. Yeah. Uh, I just like, because, like, I think that you could make the argument Alchemy is better against the field, but from what I've seen and heard from other people it gets dumpstered by Squirtel. yeah so. that could be it yeah like, so. it's entirely possible that since it's so popular on ladder Squirtel is single-handedly sort of keeping that deck in check yeah. and i'm not convinced that Squirtel is like that much worse against the field if it is no but, it's yeah. not that i think it's really yeah. cool yeah so i think uh i think even though Squirtel will still be like the top deck i think there will be several tier one decks that'll be you know very close to it you know, whereas maybe Skyatol is like a 9 out of 10, you might have Alchemy that's like 8 out of 10, and, and Dagon, you know, like 8.5 out of 10. So, even though I think it will be on top, I think it won't be like last patch where it's just dwarves. That's it. I, I yeah, think it, there'll it, be a few decks that'll be at the top no, of that it, pack. It, like, this, this meta is like more balanced than the previous one. It's just that that, that came at the cost of removing mechanics from the game. So, I don't know if it was worth so, uh, Orphan Tears XD <laughs> asks, what do you guys think about Lucky making game. create cards have a set of uh, three or five card pool like Monster Ness and Kalax? So, 
I'm actually pretty big supporter of this idea. Uh, I've kind of written about it on like Reddit and things like that, where I think, you know, I, I've been seeing a lot of kind of uh, people, you know, discussing create on Reddit and how it may not be the best thing for the game. You know, a, a lot of people now saying they want it removed or changed completely. Um, I'm kind of in that camp. And I think if you take create cards and make them like the spawn mechanic, where it's a pool of, you know, three to five known things. It's it's only that pool you're pulling from that every time, you know, similar to KLAC. I think you achieve kind of a lot of what I think CDPR were aiming for with Create. Like, you get some versatility in cards where, okay, you know, similar to Silver Mage, I can throw this in my deck and it can do a couple different things depending on what I need. Um, and also, you kind of get more variety in the gameplay. Like, And also, I think you'll, you'll increase the skill ceiling too because now you have this extra choice that you have to do and like you know and a good example i say is like back when spies was really good you know i'd play kalak and you're, you're mostly playing the emissaries right because it's really good but you know if you're a good player and you're running up against like a great sword matchup like now all of a sudden you want to pull the assassins and that's going to help you out more and just like having those choices can can kind of like uh make the game have like more of a skill ceiling and i, I think that's a good thing so overall i would like to say that uh, i would like to see that change um, I think you just have to be very careful to make sure that all those cards in that pool are balanced and, you know, all of them are valid options. Like, you know, there's no reason that Fawlet should be in a monster's nest, right? Outside of memes. But, <laughs> you know, you just got to make sure they're all balanced and, and they're all, you know, reasonable picks. And I think you'll get a lot of, um, a lot of these kind of good outcomes from it. Yeah. I, I mean, modal cards are like a really good way to, like, because the, the original reason that discover or uh, create <laughs> great to the game <laughs> was because they, they needed the games to play out uh, more dynamically. It was starting to become very homogenous because all the cards function in a very similar way. So creating that uh, element of unpredictability in the game made it so the games were ostensibly supposed to be more compelling. Didn't really work way. But the way, other way you could do that is by having cards that have different modes, like the Silver Mages, like she was talking about. And those cards, the problem with those cards, putting them at bronze and stuff, is they're very, very strong if the options are remotely viable. Like, you could probably only have two options on a bronze card. Um, but I do like the idea of modal cards. They are hard to balance because of how much the versatility is worth. Like, you can't put it on a body, even if it's one point, because you're, again, just, like, free-rolling points. But... Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely like room for that uh, to have like certain situational cards attached to like some modal spell or even a modal creature if it's silver. So yeah, I like I've always liked modal cards. I'd like to see more in the game, and I think it'll be a reasonable way to pl do the same thing Crate was trying to do, but maintain player agency. Yeah, I had a lot to say, and then Trudon just knocked it out of the park. I yeah. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> like um, I think what needs more of these type of cards, like Monsters, Nest, and Kalak, are fundamentally great cards. But you can't have this effect on too many cards because it's very very powerful, and it's super hard to balance for bronzes, for example. Like it, the body thing is a very real issue. You, right. you can't incentivize w with flexibility. You should see a drop off in power for flexibility. That's yeah. that's sort of how it works. And that's super hard to do in Gwent because you can't make like, I, I mean, I guess you could have a spying unit is the way you would have like a negative one point card that then provides you with this flexibility. I, I think it's hard to balance properly, um, but I, I do think it's a good card. Like Monster's Nest and Kalak are some of my favorite cards in the game. Yeah, I think if you put like spawn on a bronze card, you either have to make it spying or you have to make it like spawn this card, deal X damage to it. But I mean, imagine like how cool like Elven Scout would be if it's like spawn an elf unit that rides a horse, you know? Then you get like the weather clear guy, you get the mulligan guy, you get the the buffing guy. Like, you know, you have some cool choices there, and you can do different things with it. Um, but again, if you put like Elven Scout two points loyal spawn a guy on a horse, right? Then you're never ever running the the vanguard, the weather clear unit, because yeah. why would you? It's just plus two. It's just exactly. that plus yeah. two plus flexibility. So you're right, there has to be some cost to it. It's got to be spying, it's got to have some sort of negative effect. Um, but overall, I mean, I think it'd be really cool. I, I think cool. I'm on board with it. Or I think one of the other ways you could do it is, instead of having it um, pick actual cards that are in the game, now I don't know how doable this is from you know, a, a technical standpoint, but instead of 
making actual cards that are already in the game, right? Like Monster's Nest will make a Barbacoa. Mm -hmm. What if Monster's, you know, what if a card like that made a three-strength version of that? You know, it, it just created its own card, sort of like a token uh, that was not any collectible card. This lets you balance it separately and doesn't create the issue that you talked about of you would always run the card that's a point plus this instead of actually running that card. So maybe maybe there's some design space there they could work with. Yeah, they're, like having cards have like different mode situationally is something I've played around with a lot. Like doing something like that where it could like turn into a different card or like spawn a different token is an idea. Just doing stuff like one of the like baseline uh, things I thought of was for Tursetch Hunter you could just have it do six damage if you play it on a row by itself or whatever. But if you play if you play it next to a turret stat unit, it does not. So there's like some tension in there, and it like functions differently. Based like it actually becomes removal if you wait and set some things up for. So like that's just a very rudimentary example. But any like when you have cards that do stuff like that, where it's like, well, I could play it now, or I could try to get some stuff together and get the upside with it. Like that creates compelling like decision making, and. I think that that also kind of fulfills the modal element of this card functioning two separate ways. Yeah, I mean, even something like ointment or like a bone talisman, like that's kind of what Joe is saying. It's it's like yeah. a card that's doing an effect that's not necessarily on another card, and it's those are those are well designed cards, I think. Um, so you know, it's definitely possible to do that. It's it's not out of the realm of possibility. It's just you know. I think, again, you have to also be careful, too, with how many of these cards you add. Like, in the past, it was fine. You had, like, Aridin, you had Kalak, you had Monster's Nest. Like, those were really only the kind of versatile cards. Um, and we saw those cards were really, really good. Um, you know, like, all those cards were yeah. played a lot. Um, so it, it definitely is kind of a tough balancing thing, but I think if you can nail that, which, again, I, I'm pretty confident they would be able to, then I think you get a lot of really cool, like, different scenarios that maybe you don't always see as often yeah like like you said cards like aridin or east or like all the things that are modal and pull from a set of things those you can't have too many. but i do think that cards with dynamic values or like that have a kicker or a threshold based upon a thing happening i think you have a lot of those like you yeah. still want some baseline like stupid proactive idiots like beastmaster half of hunter or whatever but you i think that the threshold for having cards that can be better if you do a thing or is actually pretty high and it would make the games much more dynamic because they would be different things so often yeah i mean even like restore is like that right like you have a condition which is something is in your graveyard that you want to restore yeah and it's just that like the condition isn't commiserate with stuff but right yeah, right exactly like <laughs> yeah so more design like that i think is good um but we'll see what happens uh, quick off-topic question that I actually have. You guys are both talking about Aridin. If they print another Wild Hunt unit, does that get added to Aridin's like Swiss Army Knife toolbox, or does Aridin just stay static? Uh, I no I, <laughs> I don't know what the answer to that question is. The answer, if I was designing, the would probably be to add the thing. But well, he can't do he can't do Wild Hunt or he can't do ships right now, right? I think he, he does can, do yeah. ships. Does he do ships? He yeah, I That's think he does. All, oh, yeah, so they added that in afterwards, right? So I, yeah. I guess he just keeps expanding. That's something okay. to keep an eye on in the future. Yeah, so he just gets better. Yeah, that seems reasonable. It might even be better to kind of not do that because, you know, like we were saying, you can't have too many of these effects in the game. But if you kind of, like, make it a hard cutoff where Aridin's never changing, maybe a few expansions down the line, you can, you can come up with another card like this that's, like, spawn a wild hunt unit and it's like the other choices that Aridin doesn't have well, and that way it could be kind of like a cool choice in there well you don't want him to get worse especially like as a leader you're supposed to be like the element of a wild hunt deck you can't be like disincentivizing or punishing people for not running him so even if like you're skirting the possibility of him being too powerful there's other metrics by which you can mitigate that I think that you just want to have him do what he is supposed to do and it's fine that he gets better when the card pool expands and it's flavorful too, right? That he can yeah. call upon like any unit from the entire Wild Hunt, him being the whole leader of it and everything. Like, like what if you added a new unit and he couldn't show it up? What is he like, the laziest Wild Hunt soldier ever? He's just not showing up to the battle, man. Not cool. Yeah. The only the only danger I see with that is now you have to balance every single Wild Hunt yeah. unit that you're ever gonna print around Aridin, which limits well, you just have some to balance fun. Aridin. Like you can just make Aridin smaller. It's actually not that hard. Cause... Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I guess you could. You just have to make him small enough to not be busted with the best unit. Yeah. It's just like, what if we get like a hundred wild hunt units, right? 
how small do you have to make Aerodin then to make it balance, you know? Yeah. It, you get into some weird spots, but I, I don't mind it either way, honestly. I'm pretty in the middle on that. Um, but yeah, anyway, guys, I think that will wrap up the show. We are just about out of time here. So uh, real quick, just once again, uh, Wild Hunt Philly will be this weekend. Please tune into the stream. It's going to be a lot of fun. You guys will love it. Joe casting, me playing, um, a lot of great faces in the Gwent community that I'm sure you guys know and love. Uh, why don't we give you guys a chance for a shout out? Where can everyone find you? What have you been up to lately? What would you like people to know? I oh, guess. <laughs> don't, all, don't all go at once now. All right, I'll go first. <laughs> uh, so you guys can find me on my stream, twitch.tv slash Joe Snow. I will be casting the Wild Hunt this weekend. Show up. Please come. It's going to be fucking great. I think there's still a couple of seats left available if you were sort of wishy-washy on if you were going to register or not. I think there are a few seats left still available, so you can still sign up for the tournament. Uh, other than that, stop by my stream, say hi, shoot the shit, ask me questions about Dagon. I'm going to be hitting Grandmaster this week with Dagon. We got pretty close last week, so uh, that's going to be the goal for the first few days of my stream. And uh, yeah, hope to see you guys there. Sweet. Uh, well, I am Frank Moon. Go by Trudon. You can catch me at Twitch TV uh, slash Trudon FM every weekday around 9 a.m. Eastern. We play various card games, um, including Gwent. Uh, and I also make videos for both my own YouTube and the Top Deck YouTube, so be sure to check those out. I will be um, making a video about potential redesigns to the game of Gwent uh, on my channel in the not too distant future, probably tomorrow or the next day. So look forward to that stuff, and yeah, uh, go to Wild Hunt. It'll be dope. I wish I could go, but I don't want to drive eight hours to Philadelphia. <laughs> so. Yeah, hopefully if it goes yeah, go well, ahead. we'll be able to expand out to uh, other events and other locations. But um, yeah. real quick, let you guys know, uh, Swim and Jaggers are doing a sort of funny, interesting, exciting clip show. Uh, so if you guys have any really cool clips that you have saved up, send that over to gwenelman at gmail.com. They will be uh, kind of casting over it, uh, watching these clips. It's going to be sort of, if you guys are familiar with like Trolled and Hearthstone videos, something very akin to that. So uh, check that out. Uh, as for me, Twitter, at ShoePlays, twitch.tv slash ShoePlays for the stream, uh, if you want to find me. But yeah, until then, uh, be sure to check out the Top Decked talk show on Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern. 4 p.m., right, Jeff? Yes, I'm actually going to be on this week, 4 p.m. Eastern. I forgot to mention that. Myself and Pumpkin are going to be doing the Top Decked podcast, uh, the talk show to promote the Wild Hunt event. That will be a good one. You and Pumpkin? <laughs> Fun. Check that out. Um, it's going to be good. But until next week, guys, we will see you. Have a wonderful week. And check out Wild Hunt Philadelphia. Later, everybody. See you.